So, thank you everybody. Wonderful to be here today. A little bit in the lion's den because, and I admit this with some trepidation, I'm a former contractor, which as some of you may know, is the natural enemy of the architect. So I expect a little bit of heckling of Rachel's lining up to throw something at me there, but I'll plough on regardless. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about an industry perspective. My name's James Adams and my firm is Maconda. We're a consultancy that specialises in delivering climate tech solutions to achieve circular economy within the built environment. And I want to discuss some trends, really two trends that are in their own right transformative, that have been sweeping the industry, but especially what I've been seeing is actually the intersection of these trends. Where these trends are converging, we're seeing some profound change. So a change to some of the business models where existing models are modified, but also space being created for new models to develop. And I want to illustrate that with a couple of case studies. So let's start by defining our terms. So let's do this properly. I think you're all familiar with circular economy. I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs. But really what I'll tell you is from an industry perspective, what is the interest? Why has that suddenly become a topic du jour in such a short period of time? And I think it largely comes down to two factors. One is the carbon factor. It is the best way to manage carbon in a project. Reuse better than any other method of managing your emissions. So there's that obvious impact, that obvious environmental benefit that's not just carbon. Actually, when you refer to water or resource scarcity or biodiversity impact, reuse is the best way to manage this on site. And the second part of this actually comes from the undeniable economic benefits that you can realise through circular economy. And too often, in, certainly in my career, sustainability was seen sometimes as a cost sink. You know, it was something that you had to do, but all it did would cost money, and you didn't really see a financial return for firms. That paradigm is shifting now, thankfully, because circular economy, and I would argue, is as much a sustainability initiative as an efficiency initiative. So when you think about extending the life of assets or products, materials, when you think about taking waste and transforming that into valuable resources, then you see how we're extracting additional value out of something which previously would have terminated and been disposed of at the end of that value chain. So I think this accounts for that interest within the industry for circular economy as a new and developing practice. And the second trend, and this is where it gets a bit sexy, a bit techy, is Industry 4.0. And what that really means is this, this change in computational power where we now have these smart systems that are characterised by connectivity, by big data, by rapid analytics, by AI, machine learning. It was previously really only focused on in the context of manufacturing, but what's happened now is we're seeing this expand into other sectors too, which are ripe for the disruptive power of these emerging technologies. Now we talk about business models, so I'm going to talk about a business model I'm fairly familiar with, I should hope so, because it's my business model. And I want to illustrate how these trends have actually shifted the way we deliver our business offerings. So when it started, when we started out, we separated the business into two divisions. One with a focus on materials, so purely circular materials, safe, low impact, and could maintain their value over their life cycle. And on the other side was advising clients around the value chain, how to deploy these materials, how to manage efficiencies. And we kept the two very much apart, always expected that these would be two very separate divisions. But what happened in less than a year is we realised that there was an intersection, a convergence. And this is largely because clients wanted to see things like real-time traceability and validation in their supply chains. They wanted to see accurate dashboards, real data around the carbon, around the waste, around the financial metrics for the products on their sites. And finally, that localization of very granular data that we see embodied in material and product passports. So all of a sudden, we realized we really had to change the way the business was structured to deliver on this intersectionality, this Industry 4.0 intersection between the physical and the digital. I'm going to give you two case studies here to illustrate two of these points. And the first one is this access now to insights, to very detailed granular insights, which previously would have been very difficult to achieve unless you're a very specialized consultant or a very well-resourced contractor. And this came out of a, uh, a study that we did uh, over the course of the last few years on the 19 Elm scheme in South London. Now, uh, there's a definition for material passports up there, but I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. But what material passports also enable you to do is 
understand, uh, get a very rapid access to insights about a project. I'll use an analogy of a Lego set. Now, I used to love Lego, and if you have information on one Lego block, then when you put that together into a piece, you build a castle, you build a pirate ship, as I was always so fond of, it doesn't matter if you use 10,000, 20,000, 10 million, you can aggregate that data very quickly to build a picture of that project. It doesn't matter how many different Lego sets, doesn't matter the different colors or shapes or sizes, as long as you have that granular data, if you have a system that is able to read that and understand it, you'll be able to generate insights on it. We saw this play out on the Nine Elms project. So this was a very large project. Uh, its uh, value is approaching about a billion pounds. It took two and a half years of my life, certainly, on it. And I was, at the time, the project director for one of the specialist subcontractors on site. And we delivered this material passports pilot for the hotel package we were working on as part of an initiative with Multiplex. And what we found was that once we had input the data from the manufacturers, so the manufacturers, this is the platform we used, the manufacturers would get online, it's a cloud-based system, so they would input the information about that passport that was accessible to all users. Then, once we had the passports, and you see up there, there's an example of passports from Schluter, one of our supply chain partners on that job. Then we could build that into our bill of materials. So once we had the code, once we had that little line of code there that could relate back to the information on the passport, we could put that in our bill of materials, or it could be a spec, or it could be BIM objects, and we could collate that together. That might be for a floor, that might be for an entire building, that might be for an entire portfolio. Then what we could do is using the platform, using the analytics function, and this slide shows that process, we could develop insights on key metrics. So we could track information that we wanted to understand based off the information that was within the passports. And this is this Industry 4.0, of this opportunity afforded by Industry 4.0. Because if you see here, these four metrics, carbon, material health, circularity, financial residual value, it was able, in a matter of seconds, to spit out data, to spit out metrics from all of that aggregation. So what it meant is that we could have a project dashboard. So we could understand what was happening in the project based off the materials that we had pretty much in real time. All you needed to do was update that spreadsheet. And as long as you had material passports in place, then this dashboard would, be, would effectively be something you could use at any point in the project. And I need to make this clear, as a subcontractor, this is previously something not accessible to our part of the value chain. You would only see this at the very top and using very specialized consultants. What impressed me was how accessible this potentially could become with these emerging technologies, so that anyone at any point on the value chain could potentially access these insights to understand about their project, whether you're delivering an individual package or whether you're a main contractor delivering the entire scheme. And what was particularly interesting as well is it gave us the opportunity to measure something called residual financial value. So because of information on the demountability, information on the, uh, the information about the next life from the material and on the material's value, we could communicate to the client the potential for certain scenarios, how much of that initial cost they could potentially recover. So it allowed us to have a conversation which previously would have been very difficult for us to have. So the second of these business models is really an emerging space around reuse ecosystems. Now, this came from a project or a case study that didn't happen in the UK. This was in France. The client was a French social housing provider called Domo France, and they had three towers. As part of a number of works projects we worked on them with, they had three towers, and they were tearing down two. But what they wanted to do is do this as responsibly as possible. So they set out to create a digital ecosystem. They enabled these towers as material banks. I'll go through the process in a minute. And then they opened that up to as wide a range of local stakeholders as possible to try to get that rapid trade and transfer of materials, to really move those materials out into the hands of stakeholders who could make use of them. And it was highly successful. From an average of about 1% reuse that you would get on a typical project like this in France, managed to achieve 21%. The way this worked is because you conducted, and we've been hearing about the pre-demolition audits, conducted pre-demolition audit, this information is then assigned a material passport. It's uploaded onto a platform, made accessible to all the local stakeholders, so the entire supply chain was invited in. You had a dedicated resource manager managing that process and facilitating it to de-risk that somewhat. You also had an AI tool that was able to connect suitable deposits with needs. 
And finally, you would track all of that within the ecosystem. And I should make the point, it's important to track that. You need the tracing and validation. It is not reuse when you take everything down with a white glove approach and then store it in a warehouse for 12 to 24 months and then dispose of it because everyone's forgotten about it. That's not reuse. Reuse is when it goes to the hands of someone who can make use of that material and substitute that for a virgin material. So that's when you see those metrics. So we needed the validation. This is a, an example of some of the uh, materials that were taken out. So it wasn't structural materials. It was more fit out type materials. And it was deconstructed steadily. But what we found, being able to upload the pre-demolition order early means that a lot of these materials were allocated to interested parties even before the deconstruction began. I've got a couple of images here of some of the materials as they were taken out. And then all of these materials were visible on this digital material bank. So this is the digital material bank. I've used the, the one from Nine Elms to give you a bit of context around London. So as you can see, you have up there the location, where it sits geolocated, the list of the deposits, the quantity, availability. If you see that little eye, you click on that, that will take you to the passport information, so you can see the composition and all of the other data you want. And then the little figure holding the hand up, that's where you express a need. So you say, I need that, I'll need 100 square metres of that, whatever the case might be. That's when this ecosystem kicks into gear. Now what you need to understand is that this ecosystem it started to create a value chain. We started to see these new value chains emerging around this ecosystem. Because all of a sudden you have those who want to, use, who want to deploy reused products within their businesses. Then you had those that were facilitating the trade and transfer. You had the storage operators, you had the logistics operators. You had those who were fabricating these materials to make sure they fit their end goal. And you had those ultimately who were able to turn this over as effectively distributors for reuse materials, exchange marketplaces. So you can see that this value chain, and this is just one of them up here, and you see within, because again, to take you back to this concept of validation, you validate each one of those gateways, each one of those points, in order to generate the metrics. But you see this entire network was emerging around this, this intersection of technology with these physical items. It enabled new value chains to develop, and it influenced some firms to actually change their approaches, particularly around deconstruction. Some of the demolition contractors in France are already adapting their models. So why is this useful for the client? Well, really this. This is what the client wants to see at the end of the day, or anyone involved in this process. When you're tracking and validating, you get these numbers. You get the avoided waste, so what you have avoided by not using virgin materials or not disposing. You get the avoided carbon, and you see up here less the, uh, the transport emissions in this case. You get uh, water, which we start to track for, which is going to increasingly, sadly, become a problem. And also, finally, the financial metric, which represents that return on investment for the client. And this is something they're very, very keen to see. So hopefully, I've given you a bit of an understanding about how these models are emerging. And what I would invite you to do as a final thought is think about you as individuals, throughout your studies, throughout your careers, the organizations you find yourselves in, how will you take advantage of some of these emerging technologies? Because we really have only started to scratch the surface. Thank you very much.